Hello, good morning. Welcome to the next lecture on the semantic web and linked data. Uh, today, we are going to have two topics. One is related to metadata, uh, which is data used to describe other data sets, such as the data you can find in data catalogs. So today, the first topic will be uh, about that, about various ways of how you can describe your data sets. Um, and the second topic will be about linking, because in today's tutorial in the evening, we are going to use um, a tool that will help you to link entities from different data sets, um, forming linked data in the process. Uh, right, so uh, the first topic is uh, metadata. And, uh, because we want to uh, describe something uh, that we didn't talk about yet, we'll need a new vocabulary for that. And uh, the uh, vocabulary used to describe data sets is um, again, a web standard published by the W3C consortium. And uh, it is called DCAT, Data Catalog Vocabulary. Um, it is, um, it is under the uh, constant development. The latest published version is uh, version two from 2020. And uh, this year or, or the next one will be, uh, and there will be another version, version three published. But today we are going to talk about the second version. Um, one of the principles of creating vocabularies will be illustrated also by DCAT and that's the vocabulary we use that we already talked about that whenever uh, you feel the need to create a new vocabulary, you don't create predicates and classes for things um, that can be described using a pre-existing vocabulary. So DCAT uh, reuses uh, Dublin Core, which we already know, FOLF, also RDF and RDFS, which we already know, SCOS and XSD for data types. All of those we already know and uh, Vcard, I might have mentioned in some of the examples, but that's a vocabulary for um, <clears throat> basically for, for the cards you give to someone with your contact details. So basically a vocabulary for contact details. All of those are reused by DCAT. And in addition, DCAT defines some specifics which are not covered in uh, the pre-existing vocabularies. Um, DCAT uses these five main classes to uh, describe data in data catalogs. Uh, since it is a data catalog vocabulary, quite naturally there is, there is a class for the data catalog. Um, then we'll talk about a data set which describes some data regardless of the actual um, physical representation of the data in some machine readable format. So it, it will just provide description of uh, who publishes the data, uh, about what the data uh, or uh, what topics uh, the data cover, um, and some contact information maybe, and when the data was uh, uh, issued and modified and so on. Um, but no specifics about how we actually can get to the data, because that is described on the level of a DK distribution. A distribution is a physical representation of a data set in the form of a downloadable file, uh, or it can be also a data service, which here is a separate class. Then we talk about APIs that you can use to access data. And uh, um, because we have the catalog and uh, the data sets and distributions and data services can be recorded in a data catalog. Uh, there can be metadata such as when a data set was actually entered into a certain catalog and uh, metadata like these are captured uh, using the DCAT catalog record class. Now we'll take a closer look at uh, the individual classes. Uh, but first, we need to uh, define what is actually meant by a data set uh, in terms of DCAT, because uh, we have already come across the term data set in other contexts like uh, RDF data set, where uh, it was uh, one default graph and uh, a set of named graphs. Um, 
And uh, this is another definition. So it's the same term, but another definition. <clears throat> and here it is a very generic one. So a data set according to DCAT is a collection of data published or curated by a single agent. That's important. So whenever you have a data set, you know that it is published by someone, by a particular company or a person. And it is available for access or download in one or more representations. Those are the distributions. So this means that the data is av available, for instance, as a downloadable file or uh, via an API or both. And when we take a look at uh, how we can actually describe a data set on the data set level, um, the example is full of uh, predicates that we already know. That is the vocabulary we use that I mentioned. So the new thing here definitely is the class, the DK dataset class. So we'll have a dataset and we'll say it's a DK dataset, but the rest is uh, quite familiar. So the dataset has a title. This one is from Dublin Core. Um, then uh, again, DK specific is that a dataset has a keyword or is described by a set of keywords. Where keywords are strings that uh, someone chooses to describe the data set. Um, the important distinction between keywords and uh, themes or topics that we'll uh, mention later is that uh, the data set publisher is free to choose any keyword they want. Um, it's free text, which means uh, that um, it might happen that two publishers of two data sets in one data catalog choose different keywords to describe similar data sets. And then it is harder to actually find similar data sets because there is no uh, control over uh, the used keywords, which is uh, in contrast to uh, topics and themes, uh, which are controlled. But we'll get to that later. So then we can find um, a link to the data set creator, which is again a resource that can be a person, an organization, then some typical metadata you would find uh, anywhere um, describing a book or a data set, which is when it was created and modified. Then an important piece of metadata is a contact point, uh, which basically typically is an email address and uh, a name of that contact, like uh, a hotline for uh, data or something like that. And uh, a contact point uh, you can use to actually communicate someone uh, with someone uh, about the data set. Whenever you find a bug in the data set or you want to ask a question about the data set, that type of contact should be, um, should be in the contact point property. Then what else we can say about the data set? Well, we can say which temporal, um, temporal uh, coverage it has. So for instance, it's a data set with a budget of certain institution in 2006, uh, then the temporal coverage of the data set is the year 2006. And again, here we can see the usage of the British service that uh, I have mentioned when we talked about the data queue vocabularies. So uh, that's uh, also an example of what you can use for temporal coverage. And then we have temporal resolution. So and this is for the cases when the data set is a time series. Uh, you have observations, for instance, uh, per day or per month. So that's the resolution. In this case, it's uh, one day. The syntax of this one is XML schema duration. So it's a little bit special syntax if you don't know this one. Um, and this means that it is a period of one day. It is a special uh, syntax. So if you ever come across uh, this one, uh, take a look at the specification. <clears throat> it is uh, actually quite rich. Then uh, similar to the temporal uh, coverage, there is spatial coverage. So when uh, we have a data set of uh, all streets in some, uh, in some city, the city could be the resource rep representing that spatial coverage of, of the data set. And for, uh, for instance, maps or uh, photographs and so on, uh, we can have spatial resolution in meters, um, which basically says um, that one pixel represents a, uh, um, here, 
30, 30 meters or something like that. So this is quite specific to, um, for, well, to maps, I would say. Then there is the publisher of the data set and uh, the language of the data set. So maybe the data set contains some um, human readable text. So uh, this language, um, IRI specifies the language of the text. Um, and uh, another important piece of metadata can be accrual periodicity. That's the frequency um, of, uh, of updates of the data set. So let's say you are a um, consumer of a data set, you find this metadata record in a data catalog, and you can see that accrual periodicity here is a uh, weekly, which means that you should check uh, about once a week for updates to, uh, to the data set. Well, that's it. So that's quite an extensive example of uh, what you can say about the data set using DCAT. Uh, and the last thing here is a link to a distribution, uh, which uh, we'll talk about in uh, a little bit. Before we get to that, uh, let's take a closer look at the catalog class. So again, DCAT catalog is the new class in DCAT, but the rest of the properties here, or almost all of them are already known to you. So there is again, a title of the catalog. You can use also RDFS label for that. Uh, there is a, the homepage, which is the website giving people access to the data catalog. And again, language of the catalog, the publisher, that's similar to the data set. And then there is a list of data sets in that catalog and list of services. The, the services are the data services representing APIs. Right, um, now to uh, the topic of uh, themes and topics, I already uh, explained to you how you can use keywords. So you uh, as a publisher of the metadata are free to choose any keywords you want, uh, but that can lead to um, low findability of your data sets in the data catalog. Um, you would have to take care to actually choose keywords, which someone else has chosen already uh, so that your data sets are findable with the same keywords as other related data sets. Um, but you are free to choose any keywords you want. Uh, on the contrary, if uh, you want to use um, taxonomies to classify your data sets, which means controlled lists, controlled vocabularies, controlled lists of topics, Typically, a data catalog uses one of those, and then you need to choose topics from this uh, controlled list um, to classify your data sets, uh, which on the other hand, well, it restricts you as a publisher of the metadata, but in, it improves the findability of the data sets by the users of the catalog because uh, they know which categories are used in the catalog to classify uh, the data sets, which is not the case with keywords. Right, so such a taxonomy of topics um, would be represented as a SCOS concept scheme, which we already know. And then you, you can link from the catalog to such a concept scheme saying that the catalog uses this concept scheme to classify data sets. Um, and then uh, the individual themes, such as accountability in this case, uh, are instances of concepts from that concept scheme. So basically you point to a concept scheme that you use to classify the data sets. Right, so now we know uh, the catalog class and the data set class, which brings us to the distribution class, which represents the physical downloadable file, which exists somewhere and contains the data. Uh, so again, a DCAT class distribution, and it has a download URL pointing to the file that you can download. And it can also have a, have a title. And typically it has a media type saying in which format or which, format, which, which data format the file uses. Now on the internet, uh, there is a list of media types curated by the IANA uh, authority. And uh, for data formats used on the web, uh, each one should have a record, a, a media type registered here. If you have a data format that you want to use on the web and it doesn't have a media type, 
it will be hard to describe it in data catalogs. Uh, in the HTTP protocol, for instance, because media types are also used there to indicate which um, format a result has. Um, so yeah, media type used on the internet to indicate a data format. And then you can have uh, some details like the byte size of the, of the file. So like this, you can describe a downloadable file belonging to a data set. Um, DCAT is generic in the sense that uh, it can be used to describe data sets which are not accessible directly as a downloadable file on the web. Uh, it is not uh, something uh, I would like, for instance, uh, but this is the case when uh, you want to say I have some data, but to get to the data you need to go, go to a web page and to maybe fill in some form or something like that. And if you want to describe such a situation using DCAT, you can do it like this. You have a data set. Uh, the data set has a landing page, which is a web page with additional information on how to get the data. Um, the data set has a distribution, and the distribution has access URL instead of download URL. And the access URL, again, points to a web page where a human can somehow get access to the data. You can see how this is worse than indicating the download URL uh, with the file itself, because uh, this is not uh, machine actionable. You cannot program a script that would download data, which is hidden behind the web page. Uh, you can do that for data, which is directly accessible uh, via a download URL. Um, right. With the download URL, that's the direct, direct download, uh, you would have the download URL pointing to uh, the actual uh, file. In DCAT, um, actually, uh, I will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, in DCAT AP, which is a European profile of DCAT, uh, access URL is mandatory, uh, which means that uh, when you have a di direct download URL, the download URL, you need to replicate that value in the access URL. So this needs to be the same in that case. Um, right. <clears throat> this brings us to the data service, which represents a, an API. So here we have, again, a data service. Uh, we can specify that it uh, uses some kind of standard, such as Sparkle for Sparkle endpoints, or in this case, it's some kind of uh, table API definition. Uh, in either, either case, the specification should have a URL and that the record can point to. Um, then we have an endpoint description, which can be human readable or, again, machine readable. For instance, uh, some geo services offer a machine readable representation of the capabilities they have. So that's what you would, uh, you would point the endpoint description to. Uh, and then there is the endpoint URL, which is the endpoint you send requests to. Um, and um, finally, there is a link to the data set being served by the web service. Um, right. Now, a more complex example showing a data set which is available through an API. So here we have a data set. The data set has a distribution. The distribution <clears throat> has an, an access URL, which is the same as the endpoint URL of the service that serves the data set. Now there is a little bit of a cycle here because a data set points to a distribution. A distribution points uh, to a service, and the service points using the DCAT serves data set back to the data set it serves. It might be a bit unintuitive, but uh, here the services can also be first class citizens in a data catalog. Uh, let's say you do you have a set of APIs and you just want to describe those and you don't want to describe any data sets uh, which are accessible through those APIs. Then you can have a DCAT catalog which only has services. Um, and you can have then uh, data sets which are um, described on the data level. And if your uh, services are somehow primary for you, 
uh, you can just say I have a service and the service serves these data sets and that's it. If the data sets are primary for you, such as in the Czech National Open Data Catalog uh, that you might have uh, seen when you were searching for data to work with in your semester projects, and then the data sets are primary and therefore data sets are um, well, distributed using distributions. And when the distribution is actually an API, then um, there is this way. So the distribution points to the access service, which is a data service. So um, there are two ways of connecting a data set to a data service. One is uh, from the service to the data set, and one is through a distribution. Uh, and it serves two different use cases, and um, you can use both those connections like this. And that uh, leaves the catalog record class, which basically uh, well, it is optional. So you, you have your catalog, which points to the data sets which are in that catalog. But if you want to have additional metadata about the act of actually entering the data set into the catalog, you can have a, an instance of a catalog record, which uh, um, points to the data set it is about using for primary topic, which we also already know, both from false and from last time sling data patterns. And uh, then you can you can say that, for instance, this, this data set was added to the catalog on this date. So that is catalog record. Now in DCAT version two, there is an additional support uh, for more diverse relationships of data sets to other data sets and data sets to other um, resources such as people. Uh, so there is a special uh, DCAT relationship class here. And uh, if you remember from last time, the qualified relationship pattern, this is basically exactly it. So this uh, relationship class is an instance of a relationship uh, of a data set which points using the uh, qualified relation to the instance of the relationship. And now the relationship can point um, to a person and then it can specify, uh, for instance, that the person had some uh, role in, uh, let's say, creating the data set, or it can point to another data set. And again, uh, there can be a role specified that the other data set has in context of the first data set. Uh, an example of such a role can be that the first data set is, or, or the second data set is an original one and the first one is derived from it uh, or something like that. Uh, but um, why such a complex construct to represent the relationship? Well, because um, this is something ADCAT implementation will expect. And at the same time, it, it allows you to specify your own role because this uh, DC terms head role can point to your code list of roles um, that you can use for the relationship. So you can specify what you exactly mean by a relationship such as this one between a data set and another data set or a data set and a person, let's say. So that is DCAT, the data catalog vocabulary, the uh, version published uh, by the W3C consortium, which means this is a web standard and uh, DCAT is used everywhere uh, on the web. Now in Europe, we have a application profile of DCAT, uh, which means um, that uh, some uh, parts of DCAT are further specified, some are made mandatory uh, and uh, some are made recommended, some are made optional. And also for some of the values, controlled vocabularies are prescribed. So for instance, uh, for data set themes, you just need to use the European vocabulary uh, of um, data set themes, and then you can use whatever you want, but you need to use this one. And for data formats, there is also a European code list for data formats and indicate AP, you need to use this one. Then you can use whatever you want, but uh, you need to use this one first. Uh, again, the newest version of DKT AP is 2.0.1 from June uh, 2020. 
um, in your semester project, there is a requirement that you need to describe your data sets uh, using DCAT AP, which is the European uh, application profile, this one. Uh, it is published by the European Commission. Uh, and uh, this is the, the diagram. It is a bit more complex, but it is still DCAT. Uh, it is just further, um, further specified. So again, there are five core classes, the catalog, the data set, the catalog record, the data service and the distribution. Um, however, those are the new restrictions because uh, in the W3C version of DCAT, there is no specification of what is mandatory. Everything is basically optional. Um, so you can use it or you do not have to use it. But in DCAT AP, um, for instance, for data sets, you need to provide a title and a description. Uh, for distributions, you need to provide an access URL. I have already mentioned this one. This has the side effect that when you have a directly downloadable file, you need to specify that URL both in the DCAT download URL and in DCAT access URL because that's a mandatory property of a distribution. Then a data service needs to have an endpoint and a title. The catalog needs to, be, uh, needs to have a title, description, publisher, and some data sets. So for instance, you cannot have an empty catalog because uh, the DCAT data set link here is mandatory. And if you use a catalog record, which itself is optional, when you use it, it needs to have a primary topic and a modified date. So those are the restrictions of DCAT AP. Um, this will be required from you in your data catalogs. In addition to what is mandatory and uh, recommended and optional, there are the controlled vocabularies. So I've already mentioned um, taxonomies and themes. Uh, so a data set has to be described by a theme which is from this particular code list. It is a SCOS concept scheme with concepts and it is accessible uh, either uh, through this URL or in the EU vocabularies website. So if you go to EU vocabularies, uh, you will see um, control vocabularies and uh, authority lists, I think. And there, there is a list of various code lists for various things, among which you'll find the data themes. Um, then there is a mandatory media type. Uh, for accurate periodicity, there is a list of frequencies uh, that you need to use. For languages, there is a list of languages. Um, uh, and that's basically all that uh, you will need to use because then there is a list of publishers, but that only applies to the situations where uh, the publishers are some common EU um, institutions. Um, right. So from, from here up, that's uh, what concerns you because uh, it will be required in your data catalogs. Some examples, uh, right, before I get to examples, um, the, w, the, the DCAT vocabulary is a W3C recommendation. Then it has a European profile applicable to data catalogs in Europe. And this one, DCAT AP, has a Czech profile, which applies to data catalogs in the Czech Republic. Um, basically, there is one uh, particular extension or specification, and that uh, relates to the terms of use of open data. Because in the Czech Republic, we have uh, this intellectual property um, law that uh, is a bit different from what other countries have. And therefore, uh, to specify that a data set is open, that you can do whatever you want with it, and so on. Um, this needs to be specified in a finer grained way than is prescribed by DCAT AP and DCAT. So that's the main extension of uh, DCAT AP for the Czech environment. And basically, uh, it uh, allows you to indicate that a data set uh, is covered by a copyright and uh, it is a database covered by copyright and maybe uh, indicate that the data set contains or does not contain uh, personal data. So uh, yeah, this is a Czech profile of the European profile of DCAT. Uh, now the examples. So this one uh, is 
a real world example of a code list of uh, days of a week. So there is a Czech code list for days of the week uh, and it is published by the Ministry of the Interior. And um, here is the DCAT AP metadata record of the data set. There is the periodicity, which for instance says that this data set is updated irregularly. So whenever there is another day of uh, the week, the data set will be updated, which is not regularly. So um, yeah, this is just so that you know that there is a concept for irregular frequency. Uh, it has the usual title, description, and keywords in various languages. Um, the theme from uh, the European um, vocabulary of data themes, uh, the contact point, which is, has a name and an email address, and it has some distributions um, and a page you can go to if you want to uh, see the documentation of that uh, data set. An example of a distribution, one of those used uh, in this data set, well, it is a DK, DK distribution. It uses the European vocabulary of uh, data formats. In this case, it, the distribution is in RDF Turtle. Uh, again, a title, access URL and download URL are both the same because that's a direct download file. Media type for Turtle and the Czech specification of the terms of use. An example of a data service. So this data set is also available via a Sparkle endpoint which can be recorded in DCAT. So here we have a distribution representing the Sparkle endpoint. Again, it has a title and access URL uh, and the terms of use specification. And it points to an access service, which is this one, a data service, has a title, endpoint description, endpoint URL, and a link to the data set it serves. So like this, you can describe any data set, uh, downloadable file and an API uh, that gives you access to, uh, to data. There are uh, catalogs implementing DKTAP in the wild. Uh, there are some examples from the Czech Republic and there is the official portal of European data, which you might have used for, again, finding data for your semester projects. And this one has also a spark point containing all the metadata according to Nikit AP. Right. Um, any questions for Nikit AP? How to use it in your semestral project? No? Right. Okay. So DCAT and Nikit AP could be used to describe any data set. So it could be a CSV file, an Excel file, it could be a PDF file, and so on. Uh, but we are talking about linked data in this course. And there is a vocabulary, which is actually not a standard because it's not a W3C recommendation. However, it is used in uh, linked data and it is used to describe RDF data in particular. So uh, in this case, and there will be some constructs usable only to RDF data. And for that, um, there is the void vocabulary. It is quite old already, but uh, it is still usable. And uh, what is interesting is that, again, it has a definition of a data set. And the definition is different from the DK data set that we have seen uh, a little while ago, and different from the RDF data set that we talked about in the second lecture. So the definition here is that a data set is a set of RDF triples that are published, maintained, and so on by a single provider. So it is specific to RDF. Uh, and um, then there is a set of criteria that a data set should have. But uh, if you imagine a typical data set in RDF, this would be it. So it is accessible through a Spark endpoint or resol resolvable HTTP RIs. It is accessible on the web. Uh, maybe the interesting part here is that it contains sufficiently many triples that there is a benefit in providing a summary of the data set. So whenever it is a set of triples and you are able to say what the set of triples is about, it should fulfill the definition of a void uh, data set. Again, void uh, re reuses uh, vocabularies that we already know. So it reuses folds. It reuses Dublin Core, it reuses uh, 
yeah, again, Dublin Core and false, and Dublin Core here for categorizing data sets. So all these predicates are something that uh, you should already uh, know and recognize. Uh, then um, you can specify that a void data set, again, set of RDF triples, um, has some features which in void are or in void represent uh, the serializations in which the data set is available. So you can already see turtle, RDF XML, and triples, and so on. Um, and then some RDF specific uh, properties, such as the sparkle endpoint, in which the data set is accessible, a data dump, which is a link to a downloadable file, uh, a root resource, when you have um, some taxonomies, for instance, we have seen score stop concept for, for that. So uh, void root resource is uh, another example of how you can point to the beginning of the hierarchy. And then a very important one is example resource. Now, remember when uh, I talked about uh, Sparkle and I gave you an example from a data set of the Czech Trade Inspection Authority. We will work with that one again in the next tutorial, not today, but uh, in, uh, well, in a month actually. Um, when we will uh, want to query the data set using Sparkle. Now, if you want to query a certain data set using Sparkle, you need to know the, the classes and the predicates used in the data set so that you are able to actually write the query. Um, and to, if you get just an RDF dump of the data or you are given an endpoint URL and that's it, you typically do not know where to start and you need to somehow take a look at the structure of the data set and discover which entity is a typical one for the data set and which predicates it uses and which class it uses and so on, which is a lot of work. So if the publisher of the set gives you a link to an example resource, one resource, one URI, which represent, uh, represents what's in the data set. So it might be the one with the richest, um, richest description using predicates and so on. It eases this discovery part because uh, for you as, as a user, because you know where to look for your representative of the whole data set. So that is what you can use example resource for. Um, then, uh, right, uh, this is a special uh, service uh, that allows you to actually uh, query for representation of something using its IRI. So it is uh, more generic than a Sparkle endpoint, um, but it can also be a Sparkle endpoint. And then open search description. Now, uh, if you go to uh, a website that offers some kind of search functionality, for instance, IMDB, when you're searching for movies, you go to IMDB and there is a text box where you can enter the name of the movie and it searches for that movie. You do that, do that for the first time. And for the second time, when you enter IMDB in your uh, web browser uh, URL box, uh, it actually automatically changes to the search in IMDB, and you can search IMDB directly from the uh, URL in your web browser. And this is thanks to the open search description, because the website itself, IMDB, for instance, but also others, contains a definition of how it can be searched from uh, the outside without actually going to the site first and entering the query there. Um, and you can also have a description like that for RDF data, which uh, describes in a machine readable way for web browsers, how uh, to search in certain data sets from the address bar of your uh, web browser. Now you can annotate uh, the RDF data sets using a URI space where you basically um, provide a prefix of all URIs uh, contained uh, in your data set. You can describe that also using a regex pattern. If uh, your, um, well, you can use this to describe your IRI patterns. So uh, as we discussed that you should, as a publisher, always first think of IRI patterns for your things and then assign IRIs to them. You can describe those patterns using regular expressions and then you can, um, you can uh, provide those in the void 
description of your data set. And you can list uh, vocabularies used by your data set, which is also RDS specific. Um, right. Um, the next thing you can do, which is again a bit special for RDF and it's not applicable to, let's say, CSV files or XML files, is that you can partition your data sets somehow. Um, in the generic sense, you can say that uh, in your data sets, uh, you have subsets, and that's it. A subset is also a data set, but it is somehow smaller. So here we have the DBpedia data set, and it has two subsets. Uh, short abstracts and info boxes. And each of those subsets, again, can be described separately as a separate data set. So it can have a title, description, and a separate data dump. So this is a generic subset. But then we can have a more specific subset of an RDF data set, and those are called partitions. Uh, and we can have a class partition and a property partition. A partition basically means that it is a data set that uses a single, um, uh, that, that contains instances of a single class or uh, predicates using a single, uh, single uh, or triples using a single predicate. Um, and you can partition your data set in um, sets of triples according to this. So for instance, the subset of uh, my data set that uh, contains only instances of people and descriptions of people is a partition uh, described by uh, by this line and another part of my data set that describes organizations could be described using the second line and then i could have another division of my data sets um, for instance to a file containing links from uh, people to their names or people to uh, some organizations they are members of and so on and each of those partitions is a subset which means it's also a data set and can be described in a more descriptive way than this. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's subsets. Another set of void properties that you can use for describing our new data sets are some statistics. So you can say how many triples are there in your data set, how many entities, which is different, right? How many um, instances of some class, how many classes, properties, uh, and uh, distinct subjects and objects and so on. Uh, all this can be used to give some more information to your users about what they can expect from your RDF data set. Uh, and uh, the last thing I wanna tell you about uh, void is uh, that it has a special uh, kind of data set which is called a link set. And a link set is a set of links where each RDF link is an RDF statement that has a subject from one data set, an object from another data set, and uses a single predicate, such as our same as, but it can be another predicate. But the whole data set uses the same predicate to connect uh, subjects from one data set to objects from another data set. And data sets like these are called link sets. And they can be described using void. Uh, in a simple way, which is not very useful, but uh, yeah, it is simple. So you have a link set which targets DBpedia and GeoNames. And all you can say about that link set is, well, that it targets DBpedia and GeoNames, uh, but that is not enough. A proper way of describing a link set is this one, um, where you say that the subjects are from a certain data set, the objects are from a different data set, and the linking predicate is, for instance, our same as, but it can be another one. So this is the way I will want you to describe your link sets that uh, you will create in the tutorial today and uh, in the corresponding semester project assignment. Um, yeah, to conclude the metadata part of today's lecture, um, there is a comp more complete example of a, a void description of a data set. So this is again the Czech Trade Inspection Authority's data set as a creator, uh, some contributor, a description, and so on. Those are all Dublin Core predicates that you already know. And it has an example resource here. It has an endpoint, data dump, and so on. Um, one small issue here is that uh, there is no clear relation between 
the cat description of a data set and void description of a data set because void describes the RDF triplets and the cat describes the data set as a whole, regardless of the data format used um, to, to actually distribute the data set. Um, so typically in data catalogs, you'll find the cat and in uh, Sparkle endpoints and such, you'll find void. They can be used together. For instance, you can say that a DK distribution in the RDA format is a void data set. It is not semantically entirely correct, but uh, it is acceptable to combine those two like this. Right, so those are uh, different ways of describing actually data sets, again, uh, as metadata in RDF. Any questions? If not, uh, we'll move on to the linking part of today's lecture. Right, so now we know how to describe data sets and we know that we have something called link sets, which are links uh, from one data or from entities in one data set to entities in another data set. And we know how we would describe those. So the linking uh, task that we are going to talk about now is actually the process of getting those links. Um, in an ideal world of linked data, you would already have your entities linked and you could exploit those links using Sparkle uh, and so on to actually um, yeah, query the data as a, as a whole. Um, unfortunately, it is uh, not always the case. Uh, and as uh, we simulate in your semester of projects, you may come into situations where you have separate data sets which have something in common. Um, there could be some connections among entities from one data set and entities from the other data set. They are just not materialized in the data, those connections. And uh, therefore, you need to somehow come up with the links if you want to query multiple data sets together and uh, create some value out of that. Um, so there is uh, um, what we'll talk about now. And uh, to be specific, the problem we'll face is that we have one data set such as this one. We have another data set such as this one. And we'll have some entities described in those data sets. For instance, this red one and this red one. And uh, for the pair of this and uh, this entity, for, for the specific two entities, will ask the question, should there be a link of some kind or not between those two entities? Um, the kind of the link is a parameter of the task. So uh, here I have our same as saying that those two entities are the same. But again, the, the predicate here can be another predicate saying, for instance, this is roughly the same or this is completely different or something like that. Uh, but the situation is the same regardless. We'll have those two entities and we'll ask the question, should there be a link or not? So that's the linking task. This linking task can be uh, quite simple uh, as in this case, because here we have uh, two data sets with some cities and uh, we can see that the uh, IRIs of those cities actually share some keys. For instance, there, here there is a number 01 for Prague and here again, a number 01 for Prague, which means that if the same numbers are used in IRIs of cities in both data sets, it is quite trivial to generate the, the links based on uh, the knowledge of the IRIs from one data set because I can just change the prefix and use the changed IRI as a target of this uh, or the object in this triple and uh, do this for all entities in the first data set. And I have my link set and that's it. So this is the trivial, uh, trivial situation, but there are some commonalities that we can use to uh, generate the link set. That is of course what we would like normally, uh, but uh, for our task in the semester project, um, we want to be able to solve a more interesting situation, which is 
when we do not have such commonalities in the data sets, there are no shared keys, no shared identifiers. There are just some values and uh, we should use those to determine whether those two entities should or should not be linked by some relation. Uh, we'll use similarity methods for that. And an example uh, is this, uh, that we have one URI that uh, is described, for instance, using schema, the schema.org vocabulary and uh, using schema name, it attaches a name to this entity and it is Praha uh, in Czech. And in the other data set, there is also a city uh, with an IRI, which is completely different from the first one. It uses a different vocabulary. In this uh, case, it is Dublin core. And using Dublin core title property, it attaches Hlavní Praha uh, as a label of this entity. Now, given this um, two entities and the neighborhood, um, we are to decide whether or not they should be linked or not. As uh, human, uh, humans here, uh, we can clearly see that, yes, those two entities describe the same thing. But of course, now we need to be able to explain this to a machine somehow. How does the machine know from these two values that there should be a link? Well, uh, we'll use Silk, which is a software, it's a tool uh, that uh, implements a lot of uh, useful methods uh, that you would re-implement by yourself in your scripts if you were faced with such a task. Um, it comes in two, um, two flavors. One is single machine, which is a command line tool that takes the configuration of the linking task in an XML document and uh, produces a set of links, a link set. So really, if you would use the single machine uh, command line tool, you would just run silk, point it to the XML configuration file, and that would be it. And then uh, the result would be a, a link set. Uh, in that case, you would have to write the XML configuration by hand. Um, in this part of the lecture, I will show you how this XML configuration looks like because it is quite simple. But uh, in reality, we will work with the workbench flavor of Silk, which is the one with a UI that looks like this. Uh, and uh, it allows you to do the same things just in a more user-friendly way because you can use a UI to, to define the linking task. Um, last time in the tutorial, I actually asked you to, uh, if possible, bring your own uh, laptops because um, in the lab there is no uh, support for Docker, I think, at least. Um, and the easiest uh, way of actually running Silk is via uh, a Docker container. Um, so again, um, yeah, it would be also ideal if uh, for today's tutorial, you would already have uh, Silk up and running, but I will explain also in the tutorial how to do that. Um, but it is quite simple if you know Docker and have Docker installed. Uh, right, so let's take a look at how Silk uh, needs to be configured to actually produce a link set. So if we are to link one data set to another and produce a link set, we need to know how to actually access that data set. So that is what a data source is for. A data source can be either a Spark endpoint, as in this case, or it can be a file containing RDF data. If it is a Spark endpoint, then uh, we need to point uh, to the Sparkle endpoint URI. As in this case, we will use DVpedia. So we point to the DVpedia slash Sparkle, which is the Sparkle endpoint URI. And basically that's it. And the rest of the parameters that are available there uh, are just for convenience or a finer configuration. For instance, you might want to access Sparkle endpoints, which are uh, private. So you need a login and a password to actually access them. Then you can specify the login and password in the configuration. Um, a commonly used property is the graph here, 
which uh, basically says that uh, from all the named graphs in the endpoint, you want to access a specific one. This is very useful for endpoints, which contain many named graphs, um, so that you can focus the linking task better uh, to actually, to, to, for instance, work with one particular data set. Then some of the public Sparkle endpoints can be limited, for instance, uh, in the number of results they return for one query. So for that, you might want to specify a page size. And uh, for case of failures, you can specify the time um, silk waits uh, in between two queries and the time uh, it waits when a query actually fails, which might happen on a public endpoint. Um, in the case that uh, your input data set is in a file, you just uh, select to that particular file and you specify the data format of that file. Um, yeah, and uh, that's it. So uh, after this, we have our input data set specified and Silk knows how to get to the data. Uh, it also needs to know where to produce the resulting link set. So for that, we need to specify an output and again, Silk can output the link sets to a file and to a Sparkle endpoint. Uh, if you want to um, produce the link set and save it in, into a file, you use the file output uh, and there you specify the file name and again, the file format. Now, there are two modes that, uh, in which Silk can produce the final uh, link set. Uh, one is n triples which is the link set that you want because then you can load it into your triple store and use it. Or there is the alignment version, which contains some metadata about uh, how sure Silk was that this link should be created and so on. Uh, this also brings us to uh, the term confidence uh, because for each pair of entities from one data set and another data set, when Silk um, computes whether there should be a link or not, um, the number it, um, that decides um, whether there should be a link or not is called a confidence. A confidence of silk in um, the fact that there should be a link. And confidence is a number between uh, minus one and plus one, where all numbers larger than zero mean that there should be a link created. Right. In case of uh, an output sparkle endpoint where you would like to put the resulting uh, link sets, um, those are typically uh, hidden behind login and password because if you want to write to a sparkle endpoint, then it needs to be authenticated. Um, so the URI of the endpoint, login and password, and uh, the graph URI. And then some sparkle endpoint implementations actually. Uh, have uh, differently named uh, parameter that uh, you can use to update that endpoint. And if that's the case, uh, you can specify that also in, uh, in Silk here. Uh, so that's it. Um, one thing that, or, or feature that uh, the single machine version of Silk has that the Workbench version of Silk does not have is that uh, the single machine um, version can output uh, can have multiple outputs based on different confidence um, intervals. The confidence says how sure so it is that the link should be created. Um, so again, it's a number between minus one and plus one, and uh, you can have one output with links where Silk is pretty sure, um, and uh, you can, for instance, uh, import those into your Sparkle endpoint automatically. And then you can have another file with links that you need to check manually because Silk is not so sure that there should be a link. This is again, only in the single machine version and not in the workbench uh, version. Right, so in this stage, we have the inputs specified and Silk also know, knows where to put the output link set. Now it will go through every entity in the source data set and every entity in the target data set. And uh, 
for each pair of entities, it will somehow compute the confidence value for that link. And the somehow is specified by a linkage rule. It, uh, the, the linkage rule has four stages. Uh, in the first stage, uh, we need to specify how to get from the IRI of the entity that we are comparing to a value that we'll use uh, for comparison of that entity to another entity. Uh, we do that by uh, specifying a path of predicates. We already know this from Sparkle. Uh, so from the IRI, which is stored in a variable, we go through a set, possibly a set of predicates to get to some uh, value that we'll use for the comparison. Here, we go from movie to a director to a name of the director. For instance, if we want to compare movies to another um, data set based on director names. So we specify how to get to that, uh, to that value. Then uh, those values can be pre-processed before the comparison itself. Um, and that's called the transformation phase. So here we might want to do a lowercase or uppercase transformation to be able to better compare the values. In the third stage, we actually compare the values and the result of the comparison is the confidence value. It might happen that we actually want to compare a single pair of entities using various rules. So these three stages can be defined multiple times in one, uh, in one linkage rule, producing multiple confidence values. If that is the case, then there is the fourth stage, aggregation, which aggregates those confidence values in one resulting confidence value, which is then used to, for the decision uh, about, about that particular link. Right, so going back to the first stage uh, where we want to go from the entity to the value used for comparison later, um, we go back to the um, example uh, that we had. So here we have um, one entity from the source data set connected to the value using schema name, and the entity in the other data set is connected to the value using the CTEMS title. Uh, we'll use the regular predicates to specify this, um, but in Silk, you can also go through uh, the reverse direction of a predicate and uh, you are able to filter the set uh, of values that you get like this using a logical expression in, in brackets. So in our example, we will have uh, the entities from the source data set in uh, the variable A, and we know that we need to go through schema name to get to the value we'll use for comparison. So the path here will be a slash schema name. In the second case, in the target data set, the path will be b slash dissidence title. Uh, there are other examples here. So here you have, um, actually here, you have an example of the reverse slash uh, where we actually compare artists um, and uh, we compare artists based on the value that you get if you traverse the DBpedia artist predicate in the other direction. So it goes from a piece of art to the artist. And therefore, if you want to compare based on the art, uh, you need to go through the re reverse direction here. And also here you can see the uh, examples of the filters. So for instance, here we have uh, movies and their labels, and we want to use the English label for comparison. So we can specify that here in the brackets. So those are the paths. So now, right now, Silk knows how to get from a pair of entity IRIs to a pair of values used for comparison. The next, in the next step, we can transform those values a little bit to make them more comparable. Here in this example, we will first replace um, spaces with underscores. In the first case, that does nothing because there are no spaces. In the second case, the spaces are replaced by underscores. And uh, then we'll use another transformation, which is a lowercase, transforming the uh, string to, to lowercase. There is a whole library of uh, transformations that uh, you can use. Um, so basically anything you can think of 
should be already implemented there. Uh, here is just a list. We talked about lowercase, uppercase. You can uh, remove um, special characters, remove spaces and uh, tabulators and so on. You can use regular expressions. You can remove numbers. You can uh, remove characters and so on. Various transformations that should help you to make the values more comparable. This brings us to the third stage of a linkage rule, which is the comparison. So we have the uh, values we are going to compare. We have those pre-transformed in the transformation stage, and now we'll actually compare them. Uh, for the example here, uh, I use the Levenstein distance method, which is also known as the edit distance, which uh, gives you the number of uh, character edits that you need to do in order to uh, transform the first string into the second string. In this case, the distance will be quite large because uh, basically the number of characters before Praha here uh, will be the resulting edit distance uh, of those two strings. That doesn't really matter that this is not an ideal case. Um, what matters is how uh, the edit distance is actually transformed to the confidence value, which decides whether the link should be created or not. Uh, <clears throat> and the key lies in this, uh, in this chart here. The confidence value, uh, this is the confidence value between one and minus one, and that's the result of the comparison. This is actually the distance, the edit distance here. Uh, there is a property threshold, which is um, uh, part of the configuration here. And uh, threshold uh, says the, the distance in which the confidence will reach zero. So here, um, the confidence is zero for threshold, which is 2.0. So when the edit distance is two, um, the confidence value is zero. When the edit distance is zero, then the confidence is one. And um, in, the, in between, there is only the edit distance of one, uh, which will result in the confidence of 0 0.5. And uh, then the, the blue line here continues until it, it reaches minus one. And then for all distances larger than uh, two times threshold, uh, the, uh, the, the confidence value stays on minus one. <clears throat> yeah, right. So like this, the edit distance is transformed into a confidence value and threshold is uh, part of the configuration. So you can configure this to be three, four or whatever is suitable for your particular uh, use case. Now, in cases where we have uh, multiple comparison methods, some of them may be required and some uh, not. Um, if a comparison method is required and for some reason it fails, uh, the link gets the confidence value of minus one automatically. If it is not required, then it just doesn't participate in the aggregation phase, uh, which, uh, yeah, which is the, the next phase. Um, but still, the link may appear uh, in the result. So that's the meaning of the required here. Um, there are various metrics or measures that can be used uh, for comparison. Levenstein distance is the most uh, usual one, um, but there are also other ones such as equality or inequality. Um, also, because uh, in the first stage, you may actually get multiple values for a single uh, entity. For instance, a movie can have multiple titles. So for one movie, you get a set of titles for comparison. Um, if that happens, you might also want to um, use some set comparison methods, such as uh, Jacquard distance of two sets, which basically works on a set uh, on, on two sets of tokens. You might also uh, use the tokenized transformation, which can split one value into a set of tokens. And again, if you want to utilize this, you may want to use uh, a set-based uh, metric. 
there are also special purpose comparison uh, metrics in cell for numbers or uh, geo distances. And they are not uh, documented very well. Uh, so be a little bit careful when using those, um, but um, there are some uh, that you can use. Now the first, uh, fourth and final stage of uh, the linkage rule is the aggregation. So if you compared, for instance, the uh, names of directors and names of movies and some other things for your two movies, you will get a set of uh, confidence values from each comparison, and you might want to aggregate those. And there are typical aggregation methods implemented. So there is maximum, minimum, average, or other kinds of um, means uh, that you might want to use for aggregation. And uh, this brings us to uh, the rest of the configuration options that uh, Silk supports. Um, we talked about specifying data sources. So we know how to specify a Sparkle endpoint and a name graph, or how to specify a file containing the RDF data, which we want to use for comparison. But Silk still doesn't know which types of entities you want to use for comparison. For instance, if you want to use people, or you want to use countries, or you want to use movies, or something like that. For that, you need to specify the class of the entity you want to use for, uh, for comparison. And that you can do uh, in the restriction bar here. So um, uh, SIC uses Sparkle to que query the data sets in both the Sparkle endpoints and in the files. So those restrictions are actually parts of the Sparkle where cost. So you might, uh, uh, you are able to say that uh, you want to compare entities of a type country here. And you're also able to specify the restriction a little bit more. For instance, you might want to compare countries located in Africa and countries located in Asia, if you have the data uh, for it. Um, and it all goes here to the restrict to part. Then another configuration option is the link filter. If you imagine having two data sets of, uh, of movies, you might want to say that uh, you want to generate only one link from uh, a particular movie to the other data set, or two links or three links or unlimited maybe. Um, and basically it says how many links from one particular entity cell generates because many other entities may uh, have the confidence value of the link larger than zero. And therefore Silk can generate multiple links originating from one resource going to the other uh, data set. If you do not want that, you might limit, you might want to limit silk to uh, just one. Then of course you need to specify the type of the predicate that you want to use in your uh, link set. So the, again, typically it's our same as, but it can be another, uh, another predicate. And finally, uh, you might have noticed that here we use prefix your eyes. So if whenever we use prefix your eyes, we need to be able to actually specify the prefixes. So there is a prefixes section. Now this is basically it. Uh, using these configuration options, you can configure the linking task and run silk and produce a link set. And that is what we'll do in today's tutorial. And here I have a working example of one of those tasks. And in today's tutorial, we'll actually uh, recreate this task in the UI of Silk uh, so that you can know how to use Silk with your own data sets later. Um, the complete configuration therefore looks like this. Is this an XML file with Silk uh, as a root? And then it has uh, prefixes. The data sources, in this case, it is two endpoints. In the first endpoint, we want to access a single name graph. In the other endpoint, we access it as a whole. Uh, we will be linking uh, regions represented in uh, one style in the first data, uh, in the first endpoint, to regions represented in another style uh, in the second endpoint, uh, regions in the Czech Republic. The link type here uh, will be same as, and uh, from the first data set, we'll want instances of this class. 
And from the second data set, we will want instances of another, another class. We'll, uh, we won't use any transformations or aggregations. It will be a simple Levenstein distance uh, comparison between uh, decisions title in the first data set and schema slash name in the second data set. We will want to generate just one link from the source entity to the target entity. And the output will go to an output data set, which is defined as a file named like this and uh, having the NPRIPLES uh, format. Right, so that's it. That's Silk. And uh, that is what we will uh, work with um, in uh, today's tutorial. Any questions regarding Silk? If not, uh, I'll see you in the evening in the tutorial where we will use Silk to actually do this task. And then you'll be free to use Silk with your own data set and uh, ask questions and so on. Okay, so see you in the evening.